chapter 1, beginning in verse 9, is continuing where we left off last week, and uh, let's pray. Lord, thank you for, thank you for your word that ministers your heart to us, and we open our, our hearts to receive from you. So minister your life, show us your ways, encourage us, and build us in our faith tonight, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen. Uh, just a repeat of my thanks from last week. Uh, just got back from Africa uh, last week. And um, wanted to say thanks for your many prayers, your support, your encouragement, your interest in what we are doing there. And uh, in case you're wondering what we are doing there, uh, we went to uh, the Congo, which is um, essentially, if you go to s just exact central, go a little bit south and head to the Atlantic, we were in a big city called Kinshasa, which is the capital city of uh, DRC, Democratic Republic of the Congo. It's a huge city, 10, 12 million people. And we started ministering there in about 2002, just planting one small little church and uh, it's so exciting to see, after a number of years now, 19 churches thriving, uh, doing well, ministering the Word of God verse by verse, chapter by chapter. And it really is encouraging. They're raising up. Yeah, let's give the Lord praise and glory for that. <clears throat> and uh, they're raising up uh, more leaders, pastors, or training more. They're hoping to start another eight or ten or so over the next few years. And so it was an opportunity for me to go and, and give a pastor's conference and speak about leadership, the distinctives of, of uh, how we do ministry, uh, the biblical distinctives of just growing a healthy church, training these young uh, men up. The pastor's wives were there. And just a really wonderful time to just minister Get, get us all on the same vision. And I spoke at three uh, of our churches while I was uh, there. And I'll tell you what, that was some of the highlight of the trip for me is just being part of their, uh, of their uh, worship services. They love church. They love to worship. I mean, it is a highlight of the week. You know, it's just kind of playing the keys tonight and uh, watching you guys worship it's like, yeah, this is so awesome to see people. Their hearts are into worship. Their hearts are after the Lord. They love to just pour out love in their worship. That's a church that's, you know, that's a church that's in love. That's a church that's engaged. That's a church that has their heart, you know, before the throne. It is so uh, exciting to see. And when you're there in Africa, it's just like they take it to a whole new level. You know what I mean? They're just so absolutely excited to be uh, at church. And it's kind of interesting, by the way, uh, um, the one church I was at, they had scheduled church to start at uh, 8 o'clock in the morning. Okay, so Sunday morning, 8 o'clock, service starts. And I thought, well, that's a little early, you know, to start service. Uh, but then when you see the heat, you know, kick on, you know, 90 some degrees, 75 percent humidity, uh, and they have a three-hour service. And uh, what was interesting, though, as I got there, um, and uh, shortly after eight, they'd already been gotten started, but uh, there were there was hardly anybody there, and I thought, well, that's interesting. There weren't that many people, there. but see, the thing is, they're they're all walking, and so you just have to wait for them to arrive from wherever they're walking. There's no parking spaces at church. Everybody is walking. And it uh, wasn't too long before it was packed to the very back, you know. And it's like, wow, this is really interesting. And uh, so you just keep on worshiping. We worship for an hour and a half before I uh, had an opportunity to speak. And uh, they were well worshipped by then. It was ready for the word of God. And then, of course, uh, when I did uh, teaching, I used an interpreter. Their main language is French. Uh, it's a former Belgian uh, colony. Uh, of course, they have their independence, but they were formerly colonized by Belgium, and half of Belgium speaks French, which is why French is kind of their overall language. But there's a lot of, uh, you might say, uh, like tribal languages, Lingala, Kiyambe, and others that uh, many of them speak. And it's interesting, I was going to speak at this uh, session for um, one of the uh, conferences, and uh, they had a big discussion about what language should they interpret into. 
French, Lingala, Kiambe, what language do you show? The interpreter knew all of them. And I uh, thought, you know, can you imagine knowing four languages uh, and fluently? And, and I was so impressed with their grasp of the word of God. After each session, we would have questions and answers. And they could ask anything they wanted. I was absolutely impressed. You can tell a lot. Uh, about people by the types of questions they ask. And their questions were so insightful, scripturally based, and demonstrating to me that they had a really good grasp of the scriptures. And these are the pastors that are pastoring that church. I was very, very blessed to see they had such a good equipping in the word of God. And uh, so I knew you'd be encouraged by that report. I was certainly encouraged. And... Uh, I learned some French while I was there, which was, I actually uh, got one of those, you know, training courses, well, and I'm just kind of doing it during my off hours, and I had great time learning French, and I would love to learn French and someday be able to teach in French. Wouldn't that be awesome? I mean, if they can learn four languages, certainly we can do a little better, can't we? Okay, you're not really supporting me on that one, I can tell you right there. <clears throat> but anyway, let's look at the scriptures tonight. And uh, I made more comments last week. If you can look at that message, you're welcome to do that. Well, let's go to 2 Corinthians chapter 1. This is the, the book that Paul wrote, the letter that Paul wrote, uh, in response to them. Because, of course, you know, he wrote 1 Corinthians. 1 Corinthians was very strong. We studied through it verse by verse. We know that it's a letter of correction. And the whole idea behind it was to bring spiritual maturity to their lives. Uh, we really saw a lot of personal application for each one of us in 1 Corinthians. Because frankly, we all need to grow in spiritual maturity. And there was a lot of things that he touched on that really applied to us. Well, the question in his mind was, how are they going to receive it? When you have a strong word of correction, how do you receive it? This is where we really need to understand it does apply to us personally because it was a word of correction to us. How do you receive a word of correction from the Lord? Some, he found out, received it with joy. Some took it to heart, made the changes and the adjustments in their spiritual life that needed to be made. And frankly, it takes a certain degree of maturity to receive correction. Some today receive correction quite well. Some can hear a word uh, of, of correction and receive it and want to make those changes. Sometimes, uh, sometimes after a, a service, someone will say to me, uh, Pastor, thanks for the message today. That hurt. But I needed it. Thank you. And uh, so, you know, we, we need to have an attitude of teachability when it comes to the word of the Lord. Are we teachable? Do we have that heart that says, God, I recognize that there's many areas of my life that need to change. And so I'm open. I want you to show me what those are. And even, Lord, if they're uncomfortable, even, Lord, if, if I, I, I don't want to let go, that's my flesh. In my spirit, I'm saying yes to you, Lord. I want to change. I want to grow. I want to be spiritually mature. How many people would say that? I want to grow. I want to be spiritually mature. See, it takes a certain degree of spiritual maturity to say that. Because there's a lot of people uh, that absolutely will not receive. They're hard of hearing. They're hard of heart. Jesus spoke about it. They cannot receive. And uh, so it's very important that we see the teachability that we need. Well, some in the church received it. Others did not receive it. And uh, essentially, they kind of uh, attacked Paul's authority. Who do you think you are? And they began to question his authority as an apostle of Christ. Now, when he responds to this, he, of course, responds in 2 Corinthians. He is he's pouring his heart out. He's pouring his heart out. It's one of the most intimate, personal letters. He just reveals his heart. And, and, and right away, you sense what he's trying to do. He's trying to, to win them. He's trying to to uh, take hold of their hearts, 
To me, it's a demonstration that he's sincere, that he's authentic as, a, as an apostle. His heart is after them. And even those that he has offended, he's trying to win them back. He's trying to show them. He's trying to demonstrate his heart after them. So it's very personal. For example, he starts out with his uh, uh, greetings that are very common in his letters. And then he immediately kind of draws them in. And he speaks about, in, in verse 4, for example, in 5 and 6, he speaks about the sufferings that he is going through for the gospel. And then he, when he speaks about all the different difficulties, he says, man, God has comforted me. God is with me. God is strengthening with me in all of these difficulties, but I'm doing it for you. All of these things are for you. I want to encourage you. I'm suffering because I want to bless you. And so he kind of speaks of that. In verse 7 he says, For our hope for you is firmly grounded, knowing that as you are sharers of our sufferings, you are sharers of our comfort. Then he reminds him, verse 8, I don't want you to be unaware, brethren, of our afflictions. He went through uh, an event in Acts chapter 19, which is in Ephesus. He, he almost, I mean, he was facing a death situation and so he says I don't want you to be unaware brethren of our affliction which came to us in Asia we were burdened excessively beyond our strength so that we despaired even of life we thought we were going to die we thought this is it this is it this is the end indeed we had the sentence of death within ourselves in order that we should not trust in ourselves but in God who raises the dead in other words, he's saying, if this is it, this is it. But I know this. If this is it, God raises the dead. Either he'll bring me back to life and I'll just keep ministering in his name, or he'll bring me into his presence. But if this is it, it'll be glorious no matter what happens. And so he's trusting in the Lord. And there's an attitude that is really, really strong here. It's faith, real faith. Kind of reminds me a little bit of my, uh, when I was talking to my son, who's in the Marines, and <clears throat> when he was being trained for Special Forces, many of you know he's in Special Forces, and, uh, and when he went into training, of course, they put you through all kinds of difficult uh, training and testing, and, and one of these is where you have to swim underwater uh, at some tremendous length underwater, and uh, it's to see if, you know, you can handle it are you going to panic um you know can you maintain your 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 sense of of control in that environment and he passed and uh when we uh when we were raising him he was not known exactly as your best swimmer and so i said to him like how did you pass that how did how did you uh go underwater and stay underwater that long and he said uh do you want me to be very open with you? I said, well, please. He said, there's a, there's a decision you have to make. And that decision is that it's okay to die. That's the decision you have to make. It's okay to die. If I die, I die. It's okay. I know who I belong to. I know where I'm going. It's fine. If I die, I die. And I just leave it to the hands of the Lord. So I'm just going to go, and if I die here, I die here. But I made it. I didn't die. And I, I, I was listening to this and thinking, that's amazing. But actually, that's faith. That says, I'm, I'm not afraid to die. I'm in the hands of the Lord. To die is gain. I get to be with my loved ones. I get to rejoice together in the arms of the Lord. I get the, the crown of victory. Oh, death, where is your victory? Oh, death, where is your sting? Because my victory is in the Lord, and therefore my assurance is found in that steadfastness. And I just, I just love his perspective. God raises the dead. Notice he says, this is said in order that we might not trust in ourselves, which he says more about later. Verse 10 he, we trust in God, who delivered us from so great a peril of death and will deliver us. He on whom we have set our hope. 
There's that phrase right there. We of whom we have set our hope. Remember in the book of Hebrews, this hope we have as an anchor to our soul. This hope we have, this is the anchor to our soul. We have so many storms, so many difficulties of life, but we have this hope, this anchor, this steadfast foundation on which we stand. He will deliver us. Notice this here in verse 11. You also joining in helping us through your prayers. That thanks may be given by many persons on our behalf for the favor bestowed on us through the prayers of many. So that's an interesting thing. God, seems to say here, uses our prayers. And that he is saying, when you prayed for me, you helped me. You strengthened me. I knew that your prayers were for me. And so therefore, you were helping me through your prayers. This is really important because we need to understand the, the significance and the importance of prayer. Why, why is it so? Why is that true? Why are prayers important? Well, the reason that prayers are important is because God said they are important. What is happening is that God has decided that he will use the prayers of his people. So, in the administration of God, in the wisdom and forethought of God, When he established this earth, when he set man upon it, he had determined before the beginning of time that this is how that he will ask man to have a relationship to God and that God will interact with their prayers. This is the determined foreknowledge and determined wisdom of the Lord before the foundation of the world. This is the relationship I'm going to have with my people. So that it can be said, the prayers of a righteous man availeth much, accomplishes much. God uses our prayers. Another scripture says, you have not because you you ask not. What is he saying? Ask. Another scripture, ask, seek, knock. He's telling us, ask and it will be given. Seek and you'll find. Knock and it will be opened unto you. He's telling us this is the uh, way of our relationship to the Lord. And he says, when you pray for me, you're helping me. We are in this together. I'm on the front lines, but you are supporting me. And God uses your prayers. Do you believe that prayers are important? Do you believe that prayers are significant? See, here's the thing. If you don't believe that, you won't pray. But God is determined before the foundation of the world, he's using our prayers. You have not because you ask not. Do you believe that God uses prayer? See, if if you say yes, then all of us need to take that to heart and say, God, I need to trust you in this. You have determined that prayers are important. I'm going to trust you in this, and I'm going to have prayer be a part of my life. If you watch the movie War Room, it is a living example of the significance of prayer. And when that comes out on DVD, we are going to show it in this church. Amen. Because I want, us to, I want us to understand that, you know, we can, we can ask and that God answers. And that we are working together. Verse 12. For our proud confidence is this. Now that's an unusual phrase. We want to make sure we understand it. Our proud confidence is this. The testimony of our conscience is this. That in holiness and godly sincerity, not in fleshly wisdom, But in the grace of God, we have conducted ourselves in the world and especially towards you. That's a great verse. How do you conduct yourself? Do you see what he's suggesting? How you live your everyday life. How do you conduct your business? How you conduct your business. How you interact. How you live the course of your life. The day to day. The hour by hour stuff. That's what he's referring to. We have conducted ourselves in this world, not in fleshly wisdom, but in the grace of God. As we go about our way, the grace of God should be how we conduct ourselves in the world. And it's interesting because he says, verse 12, for our proud confidence is this. What does he mean by that? He'll, He'll speak to it. Let's keep going. For we write nothing else to you than what you read and understand, And I hope you will understand until the end. Just as you also partially did understand us. 
that we are your reason to be proud as you also are ours in the day of the Lord Jesus. Now, this is an interesting phrase, our proud confidence, and that you are, uh, we are your reason to be proud and you are ours in the day of the Lord Jesus. What is he saying by this? It's not proud in the sense of uh, pride, although that's the root of the word, but it's not that sense of pride which is the root of all evil or the sense of pride which is a sinful pride. But it's kind of like uh, when you say to your son, I'm proud of you. I'm proud of what is happening in your life. I'm proud of you. You're not saying that in a prideful sense. What you're really saying is, I love what is happening in your life and it's exciting for me to see it and it makes me happy, makes me rejoice with you in what's going on in your life. I am proud of you. That's the kind of sense. And what he's saying is, hey, on the day of the Lord Jesus, we are going to be quote, proud of each other in that sense. We're going to rejoice together. And he's, what he's saying to them is, look, you're going to be able to see on that great day that you participated in all that happened in the gospel of Jesus Christ. You were part of it because you were praying for it. You were supporting us and we're going to be there together and we're going to be rejoicing in the, uh, you know, before the Lord. It's a beautiful picture. And he goes on to say, verse 15, and in this confidence... I intended at first to come to you that you might twice receive a blessing. I I wanted to come to you. I had intended to come to you. I had fully planned on coming to you. Now, why is he making such an issue of this? Because this actually was one of the things that, that some of his accusers were saying against him. Paul said he was coming and he didn't come. He's not a man of his word. So they're kind of questioning his character. So he goes on. I had every intention of coming to you, that is to pass your way into Macedonia and then again from Macedonia to come to you and by you to be helped on my journey to Judea. Uh, This is his third journey. His intent fully is to go through Asia, go through Macedonia, that region, uh, the Aegean area, and receive offerings from all the churches and take them back and bless the church in Jerusalem that was suffering terribly. And what a tremendous demonstration of the love of the churches for the home church, you might say, in Jerusalem. But he says, verse 17, Therefore, I was not vacillating when I intended to do this, was I? Or that which I purpose, do I purpose according to the flesh? That with me there should be yes, yes and no, and no all at the same time? But as God is faithful, our word to you is not yes and no. For the Son of God, Christ Jesus, who was preached among you by us, by me and Silvanus and Timothy, was not yes and no, but it is yes in him. For as many as may be the promises of God in him, they are yes. Wherefore also by him is our amen to the glory of God through us. What is he saying through all this? He's he's helping them to understand. I don't vacillate. My word is my bond. But he goes on to explain why he did not come to them. By the way, Jesus spoke about that too. Matthew chapter 5, he said... um, don't swear on this and that. They're, they used to have, I swear, I mean it, I swear on this, I swear on the temple, I swear. He said, stop all that. Just say yes, just say no. And let your word essentially be your bond. So he's trying to explain here. I don't vacillate. I'm not wishy-washy. That's not the point at all. In fact, the gospel is filled with promises that are yes. And that's the way I am also. But he goes on to explain Verse 21, he who establishes us with you in Christ and anointed us is God, who also sealed us and gave us the Spirit in our hearts as a pledge. That's an interesting verse. You might underline verse 22. It's really important. But I call God as my witness to my soul that I spared you. So as to spare you, I came no more to Corinth. Not that we lorded over your faith, but are workers with you for your joy, for in your faith you are standing firm. He says, I didn't come to you because I wanted to spare you. Because if I was to come to you when I heard about all the things that were going to happen, I would have brought it down. But I spared you. I want you to have this letter. 
Let this letter minister to you instead. For I know that I don't want to lord it over your faith, but we are workers together. Your faith is standing firm. But notice in verse 22, it's one of those really important theological truths that he puts in there that we need to also grasp. The one who anointed us is God, who sealed us and gave us the Spirit in our hearts as a pledge. That word pledge is another word, down payment. And it's a good theological truth. He just kind of adds there to help us kind of have solid faith. But what does it mean? See, we all receive the Holy Spirit when we receive Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. When you ask Jesus into your heart, he gave you the Holy Spirit. But he gave you the Holy Spirit as a down payment, earnest money, you might say. If you've ever bought a house, you know that you put a down payment down when you buy the house. And that shows that you are earnest. That shows that you are invested in this thing, so you give a down payment. So the idea is that he gives the Holy Spirit as earnest or as pledge. What does it kind of suggest? It kind of suggests to you and to me that there is more still yet to come. When you give a down payment, you might put for a house, what do you put, 20% down? Uh, he's not comparing them, but the idea is you give a deposit because there's still more yet to come. For me, it's a beautiful picture. Because that is telling me that when we get to heaven, we are going to have the fullness and the overflowing abundance of the Holy Spirit. Now, to me, it's a beautiful picture. You know, when you're standing before the throne of God in worship, tonight when we're worshiping, the Holy Spirit is moving. The Holy Spirit is touching hearts. Have you ever been so touched by the Spirit in worship that you almost cry? You feel your spirit is just overwhelming? You feel the presence of the Lord in a very powerful way. I mean, have you just felt this enveloped by the Lord? The presence of God just falling upon you in an amazing way. Anybody experience this? Can you imagine that that's only a taste? That's only just a taste. Because when we get to heaven, we are going to be rid of these old bodies of ours, which I think are in the way. And we are going to have the Holy Spirit in the fullness and the abundance of the outpouring of the Lord. We, the joy, the love, the Spirit overflowing is going to be absolutely amazing. Amen? It's a beautiful thought for us to understand. So he continues in chapter 2, verse 1. I determined this for my own sake, that I would not come to you in sorrow again. If I cause you sorrow, who makes me glad but the one whom I made sorrowful? And this is the very thing I wrote, lest, when I came, I should have sorrow from those who ought to make me rejoice, having confidence in you all that my joy would be the joy of you all. What's he saying? He's saying, I, I wrote to you that I knew it would cause you sorrow, but I knew that it would also bring repentance, and therefore it would bring joy to you. That was my hope. Verse 4, because it was out of much affliction and anguish of heart that I wrote to you with many tears. Not that you should be made sorrowful, but that you might know the love which I have especially for you. I love verse 4 because it's his heart opened up, revealed. Look, I wrote to you out of tears, anguish. Man, it pained me to write that. As I mentioned over the weekend, it's like a parent saying, this hurts me more than it hurts you. But he really means this. Man, when I heard all the things that were happening, I was grieved in my soul. So I wrote this letter to you in tears so that you might know the love that I have especially for you. You know, whenever I had to correct our kids, especially when they get older and they can really process things better, one of the things I really wanted them to understand was that the reason that we said no or the reason that we put that restriction or the reason that we said what we said was because we were for them and we loved them and we wanted to make sure they had every blessing and that this decision they're about to make is not going to help them at all. I wanted them to see it. And sometimes I would just ask them, do you think I love you? Yes, I think you love me. Do you think that that the reason I'm doing this is because of love? I want them to see it. Yeah, I know, I know. But I want to do it. I know, but I love you. And therefore, 
I have to say no. There is this sense of, I want you to understand the love that I have for you. Verse 5, if any has caused sorrow, he has caused sorrow not to me, but in some degree in order not to say too much to all of you. And then he brings up this case out of 1 Corinthians 5. If you remember, there was a man in the church who was having sexual relations with his stepmother, you could say. And they tolerated it. They were almost even proud of uh, how much they could tolerate their progressive nature, you might say. And so Paul gets wind of it. And he brings a strong word of correction. And uh, he tells them, set that man out of the church and hand him over to Satan for the destruction of his flesh. Very strong word. So now when you get to chapter 2, verse 6, it's interesting because he brings it back up. Sufficient for such a one is this punishment which was inflicted by the majority. So that on the contrary, you should rather forgive and comfort him. Lest somehow such a one be overwhelmed by excessive sorrow. Wherefore, I urge you to reaffirm your love for him. For to this end I wrote that I might put you to the test whether you are obedient in all things. Whom you forgive anything, I forgive him too. Indeed, what I have forgiven, if I have forgiven anything, I did it for your sakes in the presence of Christ in order that no advantage be taken of by Satan for we are not ignorant of his schemes. So what is he saying? They did it. They put him out for the destruction of his flesh and it broke his heart. He changed. He repented. He turned his life around. And so he is saying to them, now receive him back. Welcome him back. And it's really a great lesson for the church in many ways because we have a tendency to shoot our wounded, if you know what I mean by this. When someone messes up their lives, we have a tendency to judge very harshly. And uh, sometimes, as Paul is saying, it's necessary. Set him out of the church. Hand him over to Satan for the destruction of his flesh. They did this. And uh, it, it broke him. It broke his heart. He repented. Asked for forgiveness. And so now he's saying to them, open your hearts wide to him. Bring him back in. Let him come back. And I think it's a, it's a beautiful demonstration of grace and forgiveness. I think God's heart is to restore. And one of the things that we need to see is grace is not just grace in salvation, but it's grace in forgiveness for the one who's messed up his life. And if you've ever messed up your life, you know that grace is a beautiful, beautiful thing. And that those who will welcome you back, and that those that will say, you know what? God's given you another chance. I'm going to give you another chance. Is a beautiful picture of grace and kindness and love. And there's this picture of grace that he wants us to take hold of. And he says, I want you to forgive him. And when you forgive, I forgive. We're going to forgive him together. Bring him back. I remember many years ago when I um, had to remove a man from the church. It's a very tragic thing. It happens very, very, very rarely. This was many years ago. Uh, I came to his house, and uh, I I said, you know, I'm really sad to come and let you know that there are some things that uh, are reported to me that uh, come right back to you, and so I need to see, are these things true? And I already knew they were true, but are these things true? And he said, yes, these things are true. And uh, I said, so you you freely uh, admit these things are true? Yes, I, I freely admit them. And uh, I said, but can you see that these are, these are hurtful things? What you're doing is hurtful. It's hurtful to the church. It's hurtful to the sheep that I've been asked of the Lord to care for. I can't let you do this thing. And so I'm asking you to stop. He said, no, I'm not going to stop. This is America. I have the right to do as I wish. And I said, yeah, it's America, but it's God's church. And you're hurting the sheep. I can't let you do that. I'm asking you, please. And he said, no, I have the right and I'm going to do what I want to do. And I said, well, I have no choice. I said, sin is leaving the camp today. I was really hoping that it would leave and that you would stay. 
but I have to ask you to leave. And so, but I said, but before I do that, I want you to do one thing, one thing. And uh, I stood up in his living room. I stood up and I said, I want you to look at me. So he looked at me and I put my arms up like this. And I said, I want you to have this image in your mind. I want you to have this picture in your mind. See my arms? My arms are open wide to you. My arms are open wide to you. And as soon as you recognize that what has been happening here is hurtful and that you would let go of those things that hurt other people. In other words, when you repent and take ownership over it, I want you to know I'm ready to receive you anytime. My arms are open wide to you. Amen. I think that God wants us to understand, I think, here, a beautiful picture that he wants us to forgive. Now, there is a repentance. I asked him to repent. There is a repentance needed. But there is an open heart that we open our hearts wide and say, hey, my arms are open wide to you. I want you to know that if God is restoring you, I am restoring you. Amen. It's a beautiful picture. So he goes on to say, verse 11, in order that no advantage be taken of us by Satan, because he wants to divide, he wants to destroy, and God wants to restore. We are not ignorant of his schemes. Now, he goes on to make a personal note. When I came to Troas for the gospel of Christ, when he left Ephesus, where he almost lost his life, he went to Troas, where he had arranged to meet with Titus. When I got there, a, a, a when I came to Troas for the gospel of Christ and a door was opened for me in the Lord, I still had no rest for my spirit because I did not find Titus, my brother. He wanted a report. How did the Corinthian church receive him? But taking my leave of them, I went on to Macedonia. But thanks be to God. Here he gets personal. I spoke on this on Sunday. But thanks be to God who always leads us in his triumph in Christ's in Christ, and manifest through us the sweet aroma of the knowledge of him in every place. For we are a fragrance of Christ to God, among those who are being saved and among those who are perishing, and to the one, an aroma from death to death, but to the other, an aroma from life to life. And who is adequate for these things? We are not like many, peddling the word of God, but as from sincerity, as from God, we speak in Christ in the sight of God. These are great verses. I, I highlighted them over the weekend because I love this beautiful picture of faith where he says, look, I give thanks to my God because he always leads us in his triumph in Christ. It's his triumph and he's always leading us into it. It's a beautiful picture. And he goes on, for example, in chapter 3, verse 4, he says, and such confidence we have through Christ toward God. There's this aspect of living in that strength of confidence, that strength of faith, that I know that God leads me, he orders my steps, he gives me his triumph, and I walk in him. Kind of reminds me, when we were in Africa, uh, I kind of described last week the condition of the roads, which are uh, amazing, uh, in a bad way. <laughs> And uh, that, the, that, that there are times when the traffic jams are unbelievable, mostly because there's no traffic controls and you might have a, a bunch of cars going this way, making their so-called lanes just mishmash. And then a whole bunch of cars want to cut in because they want to turn, and it's just crazy. And uh, we were downtown, and we were uh, um, walking a bit downtown, and we had to get across. And we had to cross like six lanes of traffic. And so they said, uh, you know, we're, gonna, we're now going to cross. And uh, I said, let me, let me make sure I understand something. We are going to cross, as a group, we had like four of us, we are going to cross these tra traffic lanes right now. Am I clear on this? And they said, that's right. And I said, well, then let me do something. I did learn this in Russia. Let me lead this. And uh, they said, really? I said, yeah, there's a way to get across six lanes of traffic. Let me show you how to do it. Do not do this at home. I'm a professional. <laughs> so you're on the sidewalk. 
do not do this. It is not very safe. But you have to have a sense. You have to be able to judge the driver. You have to have to judge the driver, right? But this is how you go across. You, you, you start walking like this. And uh, they're looking at you like, whoa, he's in command of this intersection. <laughs> and, uh, and it works. They all just stop. And we just walk across. And uh, they looked at me like, okay, well, that's how you get across the six lanes of driving. <laughs> he always leads us in his triumph is the point. He always leads us in his triumph. But see, I do love this picture, uh, not of crossing traffic, but of the sense of, being led of the Lord, that he orders our way, he orders our steps. Do you believe that he orders your steps? See, to me, it is a very strong aspect of faith. If you believe that he orders your steps, here's one of the things I believe that we need to pray. God, I do not want, I do not want to move in any way that you are not blessing and anointing by your spirit i don't want to move in any way that you are not blessing and anointing by your spirit i do not want to move on my own accord i do not want to move in my own wisdom i do not want to move in fleshly things i want to move because your spirit is anointing my way and so therefore i'm going to pray god you open doors he said there's a door open for me you open doors that no man can close God, I'm going to pray that you are the one who leads me in your triumph in Christ. Therefore, it's an aspect of faith to believe it. If you believe it, then you'll watch for it, you'll pray for it, and you'll notice the ways that God then makes those divine arrangements, divine appointments, and you can know and understand that God is the one ordering your steps. And if you begin to watch for it, you'll see it's quite amazing. God is ordering, I mentioned some of those examples on this trip to Africa. Uh, the meeting Jeremy in Portland, meeting this little girl in faith in Washington, D.C. All the different uh, ways that he worked and ministered in Africa. Coming back, meeting this, this couple that, uh, you know, is from the church sometimes. And it was just like this beautiful sense that God is ordering your way. The people I talked to, you know, Christians I met along the way. And so you just get the sense that he is leading us and he's leading us in triumph. But notice what he's saying here. As we go our way, he is manifesting through us the sweet aroma of the knowledge of him in every place. And so it's kind of like what he was saying before, how do we conduct ourselves in this world? We conduct ourselves in this world in such a way that the sweet aroma of Christ is on us. Now, I mentioned this before, that we smell like that which we are around. If you are uh, around cigarettes, you smell like cigarettes. If you are around fresh cut grass, you smell like fresh cut grass. If, uh, you're, if you work in the restaurant, you smell like the restaurant. You take on the aroma or the smells of whatever you are near. And in that same sense, he's telling us then that we are the aroma of Christ. How do you become the aroma? Now he's using smells or aroma in a spiritual analogy. And he's telling us then that people are smelling your character. People can smell faith. People can smell sincerity. People can smell authenticity. People can smell that which is right or good or pleasant. And he's saying that when you are in Christ, when you're abiding in Christ, that he's moving in a way in your life. He's transforming your life. He's filling you with life. So that you have the peace that passes understanding. You have the joy of the Lord. The fruit of the Spirit is love and joy, peace and patience and kindness and goodness and gentleness and faithfulness and self-control. And people can begin to see that there's something happening in your life because if we are in Christ, we should be different than we used to be. It was a long statement. But is it not true? See, when we're in Christ, there's something that's supposed to be happening in us. We're supposed to love our neighbor. See, it's not just learning. It's being transformed. I was thinking the other day, I was talking to somebody about teaching through the word, and Pastor uh, Chuck, before he died, he was on his 
ninth or tenth time of teaching through the entire Bible. Can you imagine being, let's say, in, 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 this, in that church and hearing the word of God nine or ten times, entire Bible taught, verse by verse, nine or ten times. Here's the question. Is it possible to re- hear the word of God taught nine or ten times and not love your neighbor? See, this is really the question. Is it possible to hear the word of God nine or ten times and not love your neighbor? And not love God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength? Because the result of the word which is living and active and sharper than any two-edged sword that does not return void without accomplishing the purpose for which it sent it, is that the word of God begins to permeate the soul, begins to impact the soul, because it is inspired by the Holy Spirit, is living. The word of God is alive. What does it take then? What does it take to have the word of God taught, received, gone through time after time and then have it make an impact. To make it impact so that you are loving God, that you're loving your neighbor, that the fruit of the Spirit is evidence that the aroma of Christ is seen. The answer is to have that heart that Jesus described. Remember that he said that the the, the, the word of God can be compared to a farmer who sowed his seed. The word of God is sown. And that the seed lands on different kinds of hearts. And that is the determiner right there. There's the hard heart. These are the ones who are hard of heart, can't hear it, don't appreciate it. Don't lecture me sort of attitude. Then there are those who are uh, of rocky soil. It's thin. Uh, They hear it. It begins to take root. But as soon as any uh, heat of the day, stresses or difficulties, they wither. They get offended. Actually, literally, they get offended. Interestingly, they get offended at God. Produces no fruit. The third type of soil is where this, the word is received, but the, the, the thorns, the thistles choke it out. The concerns, the pleasures, the concerns, the issues, the stresses of life choke it. And it produces no fruit. But then this, the fourth kind. These are the ones who take hold of the word with a good and steadfast heart. They hold it fast. These are the ones of whom then the the word of God is sown and it begins to bear roots, leaves, and it grows up, matures, and it produces fruit, 30, 60, 100 fold fruit. It's making an impact. It's changing a life. It is showing the fruit, the evidence of God is alive because the word of God is living and active. And so there is, for every one of us, that call, What kind of heart are we going to have? Me, too, all of us. What kind of heart are we going to have? You know, and I think for a pastor, you know, even more so. You know, one of the the key preparations for teaching the Word of God? You know what one of the key, I was telling this at the conference. uh, I got to wrap up here. You know what one of the key preparations for teaching the Word of God is? Reading it. Reading it over and over and over. When I'm in my office, I'm reading through over and over. And so, how much more so is it must be true. I, Lord, I don't want to just read it to teach it. I want to read it to live it. I want to hear it. I want to have it be part of my life too. Amen? Amen. And so, it's a beautiful picture for us of the adequacy of Christ that comes because this is something that God does. Notice what he says in verse 17. We're not like many peddling the word of God, but from sincerity. That's the heart that's good, sincere, genuine, holds fast because it's good soil. What kind of heart do you have? What kind of heart do you have? 
There is that call for each one of us. Me too. Let's pray. Lord, we love you and thank you for your word that ministers life to us. And the call upon each one of us is personal. What kind of heart do we have? And I pray, oh Lord, that each one of us tonight would look into our own hearts and say, God, I don't want to have a hard heart. I don't want to have the heart with the thin soil that's easily offended. I don't want to be that which is choked out by all the worries, stresses, and pleasures of this world. I want to have that good heart that hears and holds it fast and bears fruit in, its, in my life and the aroma of Christ is manifested in me. I want to be changed by the word. I want to be changed by the word. Church tonight, is that your heart? Would you say that to the Lord? Would you raise your hand and say that to the Lord? God, I want to be changed by the word. I want to have that word, that heart that is transformed by the word. God, I'm opening my heart. I'm asking that you would move in power by your Holy Spirit. God, we honor you and thank you for the move of God among us. In Jesus' name. And everyone said?